rock, someone we can depend on and trust. And uh, that's going to be the theme of our worship this morning. We're going to begin uh, with a lovely song called Cornerstone, uh, or if you're old fashioned, you might remember it as My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus Christ. And, uh, we are going to rejoice in the fact that we're safe and secure and God loves us. Um, so we've got nothing to fear. So uh, we're going to go away to listen to that on YouTube now, but before um, I let you go, just a prayer to commit our time to the Lord. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for drawing us together uh, in our homes, wherever we are this morning. And thank you that you are going to meet with us. You're already with us, but you want to speak to us. You want to lift us up. You want to set us right for this coming week. And only you know what that will hold for us. But thank you that we can come confidently into your presence and that you will be here for us. Please speak to us. Please encourage us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, Matt's going to share the screen with the, um, the lyrics on, and then uh, we'll um, go away to YouTube and uh, enjoy the song. Good to know that God is for us. Who can be against us? And of course, the image of a cornerstone uh, is from the Psalms in the Bible. And it's taken up in the New Testament to describe Jesus, our cornerstone. But I'm actually thinking about another image or picture of God that we get in the Psalms. And that is of a rock. And uh, I just want to share uh, a picture of you for you of a rock fortress. Imagine this. This is in uh, the country of Sri Lanka. There you are. You can see people walking up to the top of this huge rock. And they've actually built into the rock as well. They've uh, carved out uh, places in the rock where they can be safe. And imagine being on top of this and looking all around at your enemies. No one could touch you. Well, that's the image we get of God in uh, Psalm 61. And uh, we're going to read these few verses together uh, in Psalm 61. Uh, you'll be muted and you'll be following my voice, but I do encourage you to speak it out because there's something very affirming about the words of this Psalm and how God is for us. Um, so let's uh, say together, Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth, I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. For you, God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Fantastic words, but we're not finished yet because the Psalms have so much to tell us about God. And sometimes the image or picture of a rock is used in another sense. So I'm gonna show you another kind of rock. Uh, so these are rocks in a very slimy river. Uh, I don't know if, if I'd like to step down into that river really and uh, feel all that slippery stuff at the bottom. But here's a rock we can stand on and we can feel safe and steady. Well, it's a bit pointed, so perhaps not that steady. But in God's 
uh, way we have somewhere we can be secure. So this is not so much about protection, which we definitely need at this time, but this is about being steady in all the circumstances that are swirling around us. And uh, we're going to read from Psalm 40 uh, again together. Uh, I hope uh, I'll try and slow down a bit so you can read along with me. Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Praise God, we have a wonderful God who is looking after us and we'll be singing again shortly, but we're gonna to come to a time of prayer now um, and uh, a little bit differently from normal. Um, I want to encourage you to pray where you are at home, either out loud or in your hearts to God. And we're going to think about three uh, people that we would like to pray for. Um, these are people that you know. I'm not going to tell you who to pray for. So uh, if we move on to the next slide, um, we're going to pray first of all for someone you can see on your screen. If you want to, it could be someone on the screen next to yours if you've got the gallery view open. Um, and I encourage you to use uh, your own words, but if uh, not the words that are on the screen now, um, use these, I'm not gonna read them out, use them if you want to, or use your own words to entrust another person on the screen into God's protection, because he's their rock too. Let's pray together. And now we're going to move on to pray for someone who's not part of our church, not part of our family, but someone you know. Maybe you'd like them to join our family. Um, use these words or your own words to pray for someone like that. Let's pray. And finally, for our third uh, intercession, I want you to pray for yourself. Um, this is definitely part of what we need to do. We don't just pray for others. We need to bring ourselves to God. And we've been having a series about the Holy Spirit in our lives. Um, and many of you have prayed, I know, that the Holy Spirit would be more uh, active in your life. Here's another chance to pray about that. Uh, use your own words or these if you would like. Let's pray.
Amen. I'm going to lead us in some prayers now for members of our church who are in need. And you could, of course, add others as well. Um, but I just want to pray particularly for William. Our church supports Wycliffe through our giving to David and Shari. And I think it's a wonderful thing that we're able to do that. Uh, did you know that it's not just uh, the effect of reading the Bible that will benefit these uh, people in Bible? Have our second song, and I'm looking forward to this very much. Uh, not only is it accompanied by a brass band, uh, but it's a tremendous hymn. And uh, it's the hymn, Will Your Anchor Hold? Thinking about the rock that we are linked to, God himself, an anchor for our soul. We're not going to be swept away in all the circumstances around us. Let's enjoy this song together. Matt's going to share the words first uh, on our screens, and then uh, we can go to YouTube. Um, and uh, I'm going to bring God's word this morning, and it's a, a one-off before we start the new series, as Paul mentioned. And the title is Two Calves, um, But One God. Um, I've heard people say that we will emerge from this COVID uh, crisis into a whole new world, um, a new way of being, new attitudes, more caring, more neighbourly, uh, more concerned about equality and justice, and a new respect and more pay for those like nurses, shop assistants, carers, um, and that we ourselves will care more for the planet, there'll be less flights, um, we'll lead quieter, more contemplative lives, um, reflective lives closer to nature. That we will have learned our lesson and it will be a post-COVID utopia. Well, maybe, um, I hope so. Uh, I guess there may be more homeworking, but I suspect that will be more because we've discovered that it's possible and that it's more cost effective and efficient. Um, but uh, I suspect it's that for many people more than ecology, although for some that will be it. But frankly, I doubt that utopian um, mirage that is put for us. Uh, I don't personally think it would take us long to return to pretty much how we were before, say apart from perhaps homeworking. If we consider our response in the past, if we look at history, our response to war, to diseases such as SARS and Ebola, to avian flu, I'm not convinced that the leopard changes its spots all that easily. I don't see much historical evidence for such optimism. And apart from that, I'm a misery guts. So um, that's how I see it, I'm a pessimist. Um, well, we will see, I might be right and I might be wrong. Um, but you'd think, wouldn't you, that people would learn their lessons generally. But actually, we often don't. Um, we just keep making the same old mistakes. And I wonder, Matt, if you could show the first slide now. Um, that once we've strayed, or we've done it wrong in a particular way, it's very easy for us to return and to just do that again. So there's a pretty picture for you. And I can tell you, as you know, I'm a dog lover, I can tell you dogs do exactly that that is exactly how they behave um, dogs return to their vomit as fools return to their folly the bible says and there is a depressing tendency in us to keep making those same mistakes to keep committing those same sins to return to those same attitudes and even after a covid reboot um, it's all right matt you can keep sharing the screens i'll uh, i'll tell you when i want you to change them. Uh, we have some technology issues this end because I'm using a strange laptop, hence Matt's doing it for me. Um, but even after a COVID reboot, even after a virus or control delete, um, I think fundamentally we are the same people with the same natures, the same weaknesses and the same faults. And the Bible actually is really clear on that, that of ourselves, we can't change to become people that are pleasing to God. We, of course, can reform a bit, we can improve, we can do some good. I'm absolutely not suggesting other than that. But fundamentally, we're the same people with the same natures, the same weaknesses and the same faults. And actually, the only hope for a radical change is what the Bible would call 
a new birth, a recreation. It is salvation in Jesus Christ. Can I have the next slide, please, Matt? Because the, the problem is not so much the wrong that I do, but the person who's on my throne. Who is on the throne of my heart? Is it self or is it God? I didn't know I'd managed to get a little uh, gif in there, changing from self to God. I'm quite impressed with that. <laughs> I thought it was a still picture. Who is it? Is it me? Is it about I want my desires, my preferences, or do I bow and submit to God? The only way for changing that is Jesus. And I just want to look at a couple of examples from the Old Testament um, about the golden calves. If we could have the next slide, please, Matt. Um, during the, the Exodus, you remember there was an incident with the golden calf. Moses was up the mountain, communing with God, having a good spiritual time, receiving the, uh, the law, the Ten Commandments on those tablets of stone. And well, well, to be honest, he just took too long. I mean, I get really cross when people are late. And Moses was late. He, he, he didn't tell them it was going to be this long. And so the people all got worried. Moses was the one who sort of represented God. And actually, he was sort of the one who kept him at a safe distance, if we're honest. Uh, God was quite scary. And they were quite content um, for the communion with God to be via Moses. But who now? And in many ways, because Moses represented God, it was like, well, we're with Moses. God stroked Moses, brought us out of Egypt. So everything's okay. That he is, our, he is the totem of God. He is the uh, person who represents us and he is our leader. And we don't know where he's gone. And so we read in Exodus 32 this. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and they brought them to Aaron. Aaron was the priest of close um, with Moses and he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. No, he didn't say to the calf, to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And um, one can perhaps imagine what their play involved. As a result of that sin, many of them died by the sword that day. And many more as a result of a disease, of a plague. So there's the story in Exodus. You'd have thought they'd have learned the lesson. God had rescued them from Egypt. He showed them what happened when you turned to idols like this. Many, were di many died. And ultimately, God led them into the promised land. So clearly, they're going to learn their lesson. But 500 years later, a king called Jeroboam, by this time the kingdom had split into Judah and Israel in the north. And Jeroboam, who was king of the north, did exactly the same sin. Here's a reading from 1 Kings chapter 12. Jeroboam said to himself, now the kingdom may well revert to the house of David. David was um, from Judah and there was a king in David's line in Judah. If this people continues to go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, the heart of this people will turn again to their master, King Rehoboam of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam of Judah. So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. He said to the people, you have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. He set one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. That's the southern and the northern border. We're clearly meant to see the parallel between those two passages because exactly the same words are used. Here are your gods, and that could be plural or singular. Here are your gods, O Israel who brought you up out of Egypt. I mean, it was a good political stunt, really. Jeroboam was right to be concerned if the people kept on returning to Judah, recognizing that only the temple in Jerusalem is where they could worship their God. Well, they could easily get drawn away from him and revert to Judah. And that could be life ending for Jeroboam. So he set up these two calves and said, you guys, you know, I'm concerned for you. It's a long way to Jerusalem. You don't need to go to Jerusalem. Let me set up these golden calves. They just represent God. 
In the same way as Moses represented God, these calves represent God. It's the same God who brought you up out of Egypt. I'm not leading you astray into idolatry. So he did not even say they were other gods. Specifically, he said, this is the God who brought you up out of Egypt. And he called him the Lord. If you worship another god, that is idolatry. And here they even worship God, if you like, by the right name. But God described it as worshipping idols. And in 2 Chronicles 11, he said he appointed for himself, talking about this incident, he, took, he appointed for himself priests for the high places, for the demons and the calf idols, which he had made. God's view of idols is that they're not gods, but lying behind them are demons. So Aaron, and particularly Jeroboam, actually did sanction idolatry. It makes no different what you call you God. The question is, are you worshipping God as he has revealed himself? Jeroboam sanctioned idolatry, worship of unacceptable images in unacceptable places, led by an unacceptable priesthood, because the priests he appointed were not Levites. They were people that Jeroboam could trust to be loyal to himself. He merely made things a little easier for the people. Where's the harm? What's the problem? What does it matter if you have a symbol to represent God and who he is and how he is to be worshipped? The problem is that Yahweh, he is God, not us. We don't make it up as we go along and say, this is what God is like. This is how I will worship him. It is he who is God, and it is he who sets the terms. We are not free to make it up as we go along. There is but one God and one God alone. Deuteronomy says, Yahweh, he is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. And Isaiah, I am Yahweh, and there is no other. Beside me, there is no other God. Now Aaron repented, but Jeroboam did not. He and Israel continued. Uh, yeah, thank you, Matt. Actually, I should have asked you to stop sharing the screen. Uh, he, he and Israel continued in their sin, and eventually the whole of the northern kingdom of Israel was lost. Judah returned from the exile. Israel, the northern kingdom, did not, and they have not returned until this day. The ten tribes of the northern kingdom are lost. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because our God is a personal God. He is a being. He's not some generic God principle of the universe, and we can represent him in any way we fancy. He is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons who are together one God. That is Yahweh. That is God, and there is no other. And to say other is to rob God of being a personal God and turn him into a thing or a principle or a set of thoughts. We cannot worship any golden calf, just as the fancy takes us, just as long as we call it God. And we cannot worship any other God by any other name. God says, where is your loyalty to me? my people. I am God. I am your creator. I am the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord God Almighty and Saviour, and I died for you. And you cannot just turn to another God and think that will do, because it is not. And I would call us today, God's people, to be loyal to our God. There's another account um, of this exact same incident in Two Kings. It's a parallel account of the Jeroboam incident. I'm going to read it from the New American Bible Revised Edition because the particular translation um, puts the emphasis where I want to. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing. It's Two Kings 17. Speaking of what they did when they worshipped the golden calves, it said this. They followed emptiness and became empty. They followed the surrounding nations where the Lord, who the Lord had commanded them not to imitate. They abandoned all the commandments of the Lord. They made for themselves two molten calves. And this passage connects the notion that what you worship is what you become. 
They worshipped empty idols that were nothing. And God says, and in doing that, you become empty and become nothing. Why did Aaron, the priest, the high priest, why on earth did he do this? Did he not know better? Moses asked him that very question. He said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? Do not be angry with them, my Lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. He perverted the truth of God in order to please the people. He wanted to please the people and be a popular leader rather than pleasing God and upsetting the people. And the New Testament says that we can do that. It says in 2 Timothy, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke and encourage. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And it is possible for us in this culture, which by and large does not take God seriously, to preach in a very cavalier manner, saying what is popular rather than what God has actually said. It's very tempting to water down the gospel and turn it into something that our culture will find palatable and, ac and acceptable. The gospel is not something that is palatable and acceptable to this world. That's sort of the whole point. The world was in disarray and God had to send Jesus in order to save it, to expose the darkness in the world. And the darkness said, we don't like being exposed. And it still says that today. So if we go down the line of trying to take out the unpopular bits of the gospel and just put what we think is nice, the problem is that our gospel becomes empty. And in doing that, we become empty. What we say becomes emptied of power. And instead of preaching God's word from the Bible, I could preach my preferences. I could preach what I think is nice and good and what will please people and, and then be popular. But the Bible says we must remain true to the gospel. Galatians 1 says this, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion, are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Why is it so important? Because by preaching to you just my thoughts, my fantasies, my preferences, I lead people away from the one thing that can save them, from their one hope. I say what they want to hear, but not what they need to hear. Jeroboam tried to manage the loyalty of the people in order to line his own nest with popularity and safety. And we think we can manage the truth of the gospel with our wise outreach strategies and our careful selection of which truths we will say and which we will not. And so become attractive and successful in the church. But in doing so, we preach emptiness. So if we could have the next screen back up, please, Matt. I want to ask all of us, what is your shiny golden calf? At what altar do you worship? What is it that you trust in for your happiness? You see, an, an idol today isn't necessarily a golden calf. An idol today is what is it that I place my security and my hope and my life purpose in other than God? What is it I put first? What is it that I turn to for my comfort? What might our golden calves be? What altar might you and I worship at? They may even be things that are neutral. They may not be wrong in themselves. I mean, the calf was made of gold. There's nothing wrong with gold. They may even be things that are good. 
it's not the point necessarily as to whether it's good or it is bad. It's a question of what are you placing your trust in? What is it that matters to you so much more than God? It could be religious things. You know, we are called to worship God, not the Bible. It could be that we place so highly in our esteem our evangelical credentials that our view of that is so narrow and that actually it's my view that is right and nobody else's. That no question can penetrate my security and if it did, my faith would fall apart. Come tumbling down like a house of cards. We take the Bible extremely seriously in this church, but it is not what we worship. And it is not what should come before God. Or it could be the opposite. It could be that I don't take the Bible very seriously, but I take my own intellectualism very seriously. My broad open-mindedness, my modern um, academic and cerebral opinions, my questioning of everything. Indeed, we can be so open-minded that everything falls out of our minds and we're left with nothing. No truths that are core or fundamental save those that happen to comply with my own opinions. On the other hand, it could be not only the Bible, it could be my theology. My understanding of God is sacrosanct. You know, it's that, and, and we as a church, we could become so proud of our evangelical theology. And what we're really proud of is our favorite theologians. None of those things, good theology, good Bible teaching, being able to question and think about things, all of those things are good. None of them are wrong, but where do we place them in our priorities? It could be our family or our job or our money or our entertainment or sex. It could be our holidays or our reputation. It could even be our reputation and status in the church. The question isn't whether it's good or bad so much, but where is it? in our priorities. And I think God's word to us this morning is, let us not be like the children of Israel, who time and again walk the same path of disobedience and disloyalty and of sin. Let us not keep returning to our sin as the dog returns to its vomit. All of those things, good as they may be, are not what we should worship. There is only one who we should worship, and that is Yahweh, the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us live as children of that one God, loyal to him, co-heirs of his promise, along with Christ. Let us not desert our first love for God, our Saviour. You know, there are times when I feel distant from God. And it's very easy then to find my joy in other things. There are times when I feel very close to God and he fills my mind and my heart and my emotions. I cannot live like that. You know, one day oh, I'm feeling good about you, God, so I'll be nice. I'll be loyal to you. But tomorrow, well, I don't know. I might, I might put other things first because you seem a bit distant. God says to us, his people, you must be loyal to me. Don't turn away to other gods. Do not worship other idols. Do not bow at another altar. Worship God alone. In him alone do we find salvation. In him alone do we find the ultimate purpose and joy and peace for our lives. These other things, these golden calves, they are nothing. They are things that we construct in our minds and we put them on the altar and we say, there, that is my God. That is what I put first. And they lead us astray. And they are worthless. And they are empty. And if we as children of God follow them, then we become empty. Whereas God wants to fill us with all of his goodness. He has done so much for us. What he wants from us in return is love and loyalty and faithfulness to the God who is above all and has done exceedingly more than we could ever imagine for us. So I invite you this morning, not 
literally, we're not going to have a response time here, but I invite you to bow the knee at the one true God and at his altar alone. For he alone is worthy. There is nobody else, nothing else in this world that is worthy of your worship. God holds us in very high esteem and he wants us to bow the knee to him, but only to him. And by our lives lived like that, we bring glory and honour to his name. So let's just bow our heads and I'm going to lead us in a prayer. To our wonderful, only true God. Lord God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, who together are one. We come before you this morning. We confess, Lord, that we have gone astray very often in our lives and often we go back to the same things time and time again. We are sorry. We are weak and we ask your help to be better in the future. Lord, we offer you the love of our hearts. We offer you our loyalty and our faithfulness. But even as we say those words, Lord, we recognise we need your Holy Spirit to help us fulfil them. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we rely upon you alone to save us from the consequences of lives that have gone wrong in this world that is so often a dark place. Lord, rekindle love in our hearts. We place you in the centre of our lives, Lord. And if there's anything that's going to be on the altar as a sacrifice, Lord, may it be us as we bow the knee to you and say, you alone are our Lord. Amen. Well, thank you for um, being with us this morning. It was really good to, uh, to see some of you. I can see some of you on the screen. Um, we're going to have breakout groups now. Um, do, do go and share a virtual coffee and just give Matt a minute or two and he'll create the groups. Um, you're really welcome to stay with us, whether you're a regular or a visitor.